to this day, I haven't decided if I want to just let that music roll out or if I want to start talking over it. There's a complicating factor, people, in that when I edit this audio down for the recorded side of the pod, the non-YouTube listeners, there's a bumper music that's the same song that edits onto the front end. And so if that's playing in the background on the YouTube audio, the same song plays twice at different points. Whatever. Nobody cares. Welcome to Fantasy NBA Today, everyone. It is, I'm pretty sure, Wednesday. Six days from the start of the NBA season. I'm your host here on Fantasy NBA Today, Dan Bespers, and I am joined by the founder of Sports Ethos, the big dog, Aaron Brewski. Brew, good. It's day. It's daytime. Good day to you. <laughs> it is daytime. Hello. Hi, everybody. Sorry in advance for my voice. I've been barking at people. Woof, woof. Barking all day, every day. Have you watched... Um... I know people kill us for this, but I don't care. We're talking about it. it's a TV show at the beginning of the pod. We got plenty of fantasy basketball to get to. If you are Honestly, frustrated like, by miscellany, just fast forward like a I little. Get, I, I, yeah, it's like I get it. Like, yeah, can we be a little grown up about it? Like, you, can, you could either wait five minutes or you could fast forward. Yeah. Let's fast forward. I mean, if you're watching offended. it live, aren't you? Yeah, I, I'm a good, good with it. Yeah, doesn't bother I me. I mean, podcast advertisers they know you're doing it yeah that's why they want mid-roll man nobody wants you to advertise yeah. for them right out of the shoot that does they don't want that they want it right in the middle when you're in the meat of it by the way aaron is on twitter at aaron brewski the website sportsethos.com ethos fantasy bk on social go check that out immediately and as i just said nobody wants to do a promo at the beginning because nobody's listening i'm going to do one anyway Go check out the Fantasy Pass over at Sports Ethos. It's got the B-150. It's got projections. It's got a draft tracker tool. It's got Panda sleepers in it now. That bad boy is outfitted. Got to loosen the belt buckle. There's so much in that tummy. And it's six bucks a month. Uh, all sport also includes football and yeah, baseball. Say, that's, what's all sport? that's right. That's my and favorite that's one up. right now. Well, you might as well. Yeah, you might you, as well win basketball you... and football and baseball. Yeah, I mean, I think they're fun, too. Baseball's fun. You know, if you got somebody telling you what to do, that's I don't think OG I could do it like yeah. Joe Rico. That's the and, and then football. Player, you all play football. Somebody's dragging you into a football draft. I, I still get dragged into football drafts. I know. I so yeah, get the all year. sport. I mean, that's a stupidly low price. That's Lock true. Some of you watching in. this live, it's eight. A lot of people watching this after the fact, it may have already gone up to nine. Whatever. Get it fast. Don't wait to watch and listen to our shows. That's the lesson here. The thing I was going to ask you, Brew, by the way, have you watched Shrinking on Apple TV? No, I haven't watched anything. I'm stuck in the middle of uh, uh, Better Call Saul. I've, I've been oh. there for a while. Don't I'm say actually, anything. I don't need to no, hear. No, no, I'm not. I'm not gonna because I am also. So that show had, I think, three or four seasons before writers strike, like a few years back, not the one that just ended. And there was a gap between four and five, maybe I might be getting that wrong. Someone, a writer out there is going to yell at me and, and I deserve it. Uh, but I'm just finally cycling back through that one too. You and I are both watching better call Saul way the hell after the fact, this is lovely. Well, yeah. So, um, so at my house, we got a, a tenant unit and uh, this is a tenant, you know, got a couple beers in her the other day and started lipping off about better call oh, Saul. I was no. like, wait, lady, wait, anything you say, <laughs> I will, completely immediately know and i think i know it and i don't even want to say it because you're in the yeah. middle of it right now and so who knows somebody yeah. out there could be in the middle of it anything i say will tip you off and I, she tipped me yeah, off I don't... and see i'm just gonna shut up i don't want to say anything no no i'm just nothing done. at all i'm talking about it we'll just it's you, all good man you, you, that's you, all you that's are that. la ladies man 420 who wants to be mad at us you know <laughs> i'm just done i hope, I hope that let's that's talk Metros, fantasy basketball all right, so let's navigate the draft. Yeah, I thought you were yeah, talking about it. the ladies' man. Uh, I'm not going to get sidetracked by a ladies' man discussion because you know that's my thing with Bogman. Me and Boggs, man, we go back and forth. I'll believe, like it, if, I'll believe it when I see it that you can stop talking about the ladies' man. I can't any really so-called fish it. sandwiches. So you don't want a fish sandwich? <laughs> God damn it. We did it anyway. All right. Okay. So here's what we're getting into on today's show. Uh, how to navigate a draft. This is a big, big picture item. 
that I think a lot of folks are actually struggling with. It's something that experts, novices, each have different areas where they scuffle on draft days. And so in my mind, I was trying to go through, okay, what are things that I struggled with when I was first starting out? What are things that I'm struggling with right now? Brew, I'm sure there are one or two things that even you're like trying to knock on the side of your head. Like, don't do that thing that always gets in there. I'll tell everybody the thing that I struggle with right now is specifically when I'm drafting anywhere near the end of a round. I know I'm getting like right into the weeds quickly here, but I, I want people to know you're not alone with things. If I'm near a turn, front or back end turn on, on a snake draft, I struggle with this idea of, well, if I take this guy here, it doesn't have the amount of value that I'm used to getting if I take him in the middle of a round. But sometimes you just have to be comfortable slicing off six slots of perceived value if it's a player you believe is out in front of where you have them. And I I still struggle with that. I get to my turn or I get to my pair of selections in these drafts and I'm like I don't want to take that guy because I prefer to take him at 44 or something like that and it's my pick at 36 37 and on principle I'm not going to do it but that's dumb right tell me I'm dumb you have carte blanche but when you say based on principle it was immediately dumb mm-hmm. but if you do it based on principle that's dumb that's dumb <laughs> but yeah look I, know I mean drafting in the, the ends it's very difficult I don't like it. I think it's, that's why auction drafts are great. Um, For that specific issue, I I really, I think the only silver lining there is you do get a degree of control over how you go about that second pick. Cause you get to really, if you're the second to last pick, if you're the end, it just kind of really sucks. But if you've got one or two GMs on the outside of you heading into that turn, you can look at their uh, lineups and determine, you know, have they gone just gonzo on centers and then you're looking at the center and you're like, okay, well, I shouldn't take that center first. I'll take that center second because they don't need a center. Pretty easy stuff right there. Um, you do got to take your shots. And and I think in that spot, more than anything, you really do got to game out your draft. Like you got to understand what the, where the pockets of value are. And, and that's something I'm probably 30 drafts deep now, um, <clears throat> you know, of drafts I actually care about. And by the way, the draft tracker is amazing. I've done no one. way in hell I've been able. You've done thirty, and I've done oh. one. <laughs> wow! I know, I know. What it was yesterday. It was, it was a keeper draft. I draft as close as I can to the start of the season. Fair. I know you have really that's, important that's ones around fair. that time as well. So it, you know, stuff comes up. Guys get hurt. I think who Jared Allen is going to miss the beginning of the season, right? Isn't that a thing? Like these are why you draft like yeah. he might be back yeah yeah anyway it doesn't matter that's not even the main point there uh what about you let me start with you on this one and then we'll go to sort of the laundry list is there something that you even after multiple decades of this of being an analyst of like staring at this stuff all day all night every day and doing you're probably almost into the thousands of drafts if you not might actually be in the thousands of fantasy drafts what do you still struggle with? Steals. Steals. Constantly. Steals. That's no weird. joke. I mean, because yeah, no, I mean, I think the market doesn't understand the value of steals. They're everywhere. I, I mean, so basically, I end up playing against myself so much because at some point in time the steals will be there. And so when you're looking in terms of pure value, sometimes you're gonna end up taking somebody a little bit later um, or, or, or taking a guy that you have ranked lower, you know, ex, you have a lower expectation for however you wanna put it. And you're taking them because you know you're gonna get those steals later. And it took me forever to really stop doing that. I still do it and, it, it, and I, I find myself drafting these kind of weird inverse, you know, inverse teams where they're completely not who I think is the best at that draft slot. And it's fine because I know that I'm going to get those steals. So if we're measuring in terms of pure value, yeah, I'm going to take a little bit of a loss on that stuff. But if you do it the other way and, and, and you're going to lap the field in steals or, you know, win by some stupid amount, you're also not doing it right that way. So that's, that's my personal thing. And I think that's more a function of the market, you know, 
and, and of anything than anything else. If these guys were correctly ranked, then I wouldn't have that problem. Um, so that's a big one. And then league settings. That's absolutely everything. Positionality, one center versus two centers. That's I think the first thing you gotta look at in a draft is is it one center or two centers? And I see a lot of people banging on on two center leagues. I actually like it. I think it it creates a scarcity and it creates a need to make a choice early on in a draft. Am I going to take care of this or am I going to look at this list of centers that I have that I know I can get late and, and rely on that. And yeah, that's been and something you, I've been kind of going back on. Yeah. I was going to say, yeah, like, you could, you could hang yourself nice out to dry that way. If you don't get them, you're, you're screwed. There isn't there isn't a yeah. way to come back from that. If you get to the end, you're like, oh crap, I didn't get the two I needed. That's and, well, and centers are interesting no. because yeah, it's like on one hand, if you can nail down centers, it helps your team so much in, in so many different ways. Um, so they and especially in a two center format, and, and I think it's even true in a one center format, because it just depends on settings, of course, but like Big man stats are good is the summary of, of the point. High field goal percentage, good blocks, good boards. And then if you're not killing yourself on free throws, this solves so many problems for your team. So even in a one center format, if you can get power forwards who do that, you know, or whatever the case may be, I've always found that, that that's a, um, it's a good thing for your team. Now, is that going to help you when, say that that kind of player is not available or shouldn't be taken i should say in like until like the 50 60 70 range and and you're sitting there and you're like well you know i got this player he's like a top 30 guy you know should i go for a center nail this thing down get the right stat set that i would like and leave this 30 on the table here you know, this this 30 ranked player on the table and that's the in and out of the draft that i think it's fascinating whether it's a snake draft or it's an auction draft you just constantly are being put on some, some very strategic decisions in real time um uh, with the fast clock interesting things happen um again the draft tracker like without a tool like that i don't know how you compete um and in in th this case with the draft tracker i have that we have i should say you can go so fast with it like and that's so important if you've got a clock that's a 60 second clock um i mean some people get crazy and take that thing down even lower to keep up with what's going on you got to have a fast tool you don't you, you can't have something that's going to be you know taking five years to reload you, you can't have to be like scrolling up and down the page doing all this crazy stuff um you know data all over the place you, you need something that's quick and succinct and then you can start to zig when when others zag i mean a great example i think was in a draft I, i'm drafting with what i would call an intermediate league and the guy that i haven't taken anywhere and i think he's a good player Jakob pertle you know i'm on the turn you know so cool that sucks but whatever and i'm sitting there looking at my team and i'm like i got so much free throw advantage right now and I need rebounds so bad and everything else is great. You know, it's gravy, man. I'm going to take Jakob Pertle for the first time this season. Cause I know I got five guys behind him that I can take in the, in the coming rounds and you know, they're all very high, highly valued. So you make a decision on the fly. I'm going to take a guy that he's not ranked as high as the other guys. I don't particularly like him, you know, because of the free throw issues, you know, in a lot of drafts, but here I am, I'm taking him. And, and you just got to zig when, when you need to zig and zag when you need to zag. And um, I, I think uh, str strategically, you just kind of got to be looking at what's the value in each category. What do you have? And it's just shifting all over the place. So that actually takes me to one of the uh, questions that I think probably is useful for both novice and intermediate, maybe even expert players as well, is uh, at what point in a fantasy draft are you now starting to look at more specific team needs versus just strictly higher ranked player you said Jakob Pearl he's going in the 70s in a lot of drafts 
is that the time to start filling in the gaps on your team or is it earlier on? One of the greatest, I know this is just like a walking ad for the draft tracker, but seriously, it's, it's been a game changer for me personally. I, I, I answer usually about 10 drafts a year and, and this year, and I even got medical issues that keep me off a keyboard. I'm in like 30 this year. And, and I, and I, I took it on cause I was like, I can, you know, this thing's allowing me to do that to answer your question. The thing will, it's got a bunch of different settings. One of them is you can have it set to show totals for the entire year. So yeah, okay, sixth round, seventh round, I've made my plays. They've all kind of been, let's just say they were by the book and they were all great plays or whatever, you know, I feel great about it. But then you look at your team and you're like, man, I'm gonna get a one in rebounds if I don't do something about it. You know, if you're head to head and you intend to punt rebounds, whatever it might be, that's another story, you know, that's a strategy. But a lot of times, five or six players come off the board, you did a good thing. You got what would be five or six top 30 players, you know? You're just kicking ass, great job. Now what? Are you gonna just throw this thing off the rails because you didn't get ahead of the, the need for your team when you could make a difference? And, and, and how you know when you're looking at totals, say you're just completely down in rebounds, we'll just keep using that as the example, and, and you're like, looking at these totals and you're like, man, there's like three or four guys on the board that get over 300 rebounds in a season. And everybody else is getting less than that or, and they're all really bunched up at these super low numbers. And you're like, and there's only like five guys left in the draft that can actually deal with this deficiency I have. Then you go, all right, three of these guys, I know I can get round 12, whatever, you know? So I, I, those, they're my safety blanket. These two guys, I got to make a choice. I either got to go on them right now, or I'm looking at the other side of the equation, and this tool will, will bring all the players that you should be looking at right up into your line of sight. And it's like, are those guys worth it to pass up on what might be my only chance to effectively win this league? Because if you're going to go down heavy in a category and get a one in it, you might as well have been punting it from the beginning. And so you do need to um, look at it almost existentially in round six or seven or eight. If you do end up, you did a good thing, you drafted all the right guys, but for whatever reason, the deficiencies are what they are. And you only have two rounds to address them because it's impossible after that point to do so. And a tool like the draft tracker just makes it stupid easy to see where the, where the lines are, where the cut lines are, so to speak, in your decision-making process. So you're just evaluating at that point, can I sneak in another high value guy or do I got to go for the thing that absolutely matters right now? So it's, um, that's why I love this sport. You know, it's, it's constantly me, uh, fluctuating based on who people draft. Let me dial you back a little bit earlier in the draft. Even, um, one of the things that, uh, I know comes up in this same discussion is after like two rounds or even after one round, you can have, sort of a uh, wonky view of how your team stacks up against others because like whatever you get in the first round and the second round, you're going to be very, very good in, in however many categories. And like it does feel like the days of traditional big, small pairing in the first and second round are kind of over. Well, maybe I should ask you about that. Is that over now? Because there's like <clears throat> who, who like Joel Embiid is no. your traditional pick in the first and it still exists. And he's shooting threes and – yeah, right. yeah, yeah, no, I think I get, I get, I, I get, I get questions about it all the time. I get people asking me, should I pair this guy with this guy? I'd say half of the questions I think are, are good questions in the sense that they are actually the right question to be asking. The other half are to me like, no, I, I, I just take the best player, you know, because whatever, whatever you're thinking here is not, you know, the juice isn't worth the squeeze on whatever your idea is. Um, but yeah, no, it's, you, you find, People are doing that. And then you just have to know what is what. Like sometimes like you get two of the highest assist players in the league. Yeah, you're probably okay in that category the rest of the way. Um, you get two of the highest block guys early on, you might be good the rest of the way. You need to, to really think about, you know, how that all stacks up. Um, and, and it, 
I don't know if it comes into play with like your third or your fourth selection, but it definitely comes into play soon. And if you don't have some degree of, of knowledge about what you're doing at that point in time, you will end up wasting value. So it's, it's just about not wasting value and, and tracking where you're at between the categories. That's, that's the way that you, you keep from doing that. And then you can even find more pockets of value once you get to that spot. Because you might take a guy that's got a pretty high ADP. It's not somebody you would normally take. And then you're going to get the guy that you had highly ranked after that. And it's maybe not a move you, you would have made if you weren't open to the idea of taking somebody who you had, had ranked lower. It kind of comes back to that ego thing. It's like, okay, I think this guy's better. I think he's got a better value. I've, I've got him ranked higher in the B150. But man, this player right here, you know man, I got to take him like 10 slots early over ADP. That's, that's like embarrassing. You know, I'm supposed to do that the other way, but that's the key to my team right there. So you really got, and it's happening so fast. You have to be able to um, kind of check yourself and be like, yeah, no, I'm going to take Bobby Portis. No, you know, Bobby Portis <laughs> just sitting wow. there. You know, he's got his 138 EP or whatever. And I'm like, man, I got to take this guy at 110. Just because that's I'll the one us. that if it slips through. Yeah, fair enough. Okay, let yeah, me ask that, you more. At that stage of the draft, you might need his rebounds. So for novices, let me, because I think some of the stuff we're covering right now is is a little more intermediate and expert understanding like how value works and where you attack certain guys. Let's say we're more of a novice level player, kind of getting in and trying to make sure that they have a good draft. Is it more important for a novice player to win the draft or to not screw it completely up? Because I think the answer might be the latter. Mm -hmm. Who are they playing against? Let's say Is it's it other novices. Yeah, novices, maybe a couple intermediates floating around in there. Do they have the draft tracker? <laughs> Do they have the B-150? The it's a serious question because like, yeah, get some help. Reason being, that's if you if you yeah, you know, if you have a draft list that's good, you know, if you're if you're a novice walking into like let's if you're a novice and you just got a list from a big box site, I don't know. I would I would think you you might be like okay, so the idea that you can just not screw it up, what does that mean? That means like don't draft injury prone dude that we Pretty know much. is going to fall apart. You know, don't draft head case guy who's guaranteed to blow it. Gee, I wonder those two things. There's a few of these days. Yeah, basically, I think that's I think that does sort of sum up the question a little bit. Should it should someone just learning I mean, presumably, if they're brand new, they're going to be competing against someone with a little bit more experience than them. But it does feel like they shouldn't dive straight into the deep end. I, I would go off the top of the list. And I mean, if you have a draft tracker, then you can at least just. If I tell you this one thing, watch the steals. <laughs> That's watch your thing. The because they, they're, they're available. They're everywhere. And so are not, you saying it, wait on them then? Make sure I'm understanding. I'm this saying thing. just keep an eye on it. Like if you if you're gonna lap the field in that category, it's too much. I think as a novice, if you take one thing from this sort of kind of wonky discussion, take that one thing. Um, if if you're trying to not draft injury prone players, maybe look at our our draft guide and get a sense for who those guys are before you go into the draft and put a little mark on your sheet. You know, before them, if you have a B one fifty, you know, or some good rank list, I don't, I don't know what you know that might be, but like then I think you can just go from the top of the list and and risk be damned. Like take an injury prone guy because you're going to have other players that back him up. That'll be good. Do you? There's been. Um... Man, I've been trying to push back on this on on social a little bit. By the way, talking to Aaron Bruski at Aaron Bruski on social, um, there's been a push to, I think, 
look le- and you and I have talked about this a little bit on a previous show, but I think this is actually relevant for both intermediate or both novice and intermediate, maybe not as much for expert level players. because they probably already know how they feel about it. And I don't know that you and I yelling at them, is going to change it either way. I think there's been a push lately to not look at totals ranks as much. And I, I just, I feel like folks have tried to oversimplify fantasy in a way that doesn't actually work because anybody that's listened to to my show for the last half decade knows my number one job i'm trying to make fantasy basketball a little bit easier for people listening here is the we i get it we don't all have two three four hundred hours this is what analysts we're spending our time on so hopefully you don't have to basically let me present this to you in a way that is uh easy for your brain to process we're going to try to go find values in a way that doesn't require you to do nine thousand hours of digging But so I get it on paper, the idea of trying to simplify the way that we look at these things, but I just don't think that's a way that's reasonable to do. I think that totals make a lot of sense in certain areas and per game makes sense in certain areas as well, where you can kind of look at one or the other or both. What does a novice or intermediate fantasy player need to know when they're looking at totals ranks per game ranks? Is it as simple as, is this guy injury prone or not, or is there more going on than that? Yeah, I think it's, is it, are they injury prone or not? Um, that question is sort of the difference in a nutshell between a per game and a totals rank. And, and it's, I mean, if you're looking at a novice and, and trying to help them be better, I'm kind of thinking of a, of a guy, I can't remember his name. I can, but I can't say it. Uh, <laughs> His uh, philosophy was he just takes freaking good players. Like, you know, I, I'm, I'm misplacing a word there. What he meant by that is kind of like stats be damned. I just want the best players out there. Um, so that's a that's a piece of advice that it's not optimizing the the assets at all. But it is a pretty good piece of advice in the sense that, you know, if you're if you look at nine categories or eight categories and you're just like, whoa, 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 whoa this is too much. You know, you could come back to that, you know, pick good players. I know breaking news here on the show is uh, <laughs> you pick good players and, and, and you win. But um, yeah, no, I don't know why there's a pushback against totals. Like even in a head to head league, this is what we talked about on the other show. It's like, so we're going to say that this per game rank is, is uh, more relevant in week 22 versus week 23 versus week 24 versus week 21 versus week 20. Okay. I mean, we're just guessing, right? At this point. Oh, hey, I got a great way to incorporate a guess into some sort of valuation method. How much does the guy play? How much does he stay on the floor? Yeah. It matters. Oh, yeah. Totals rank. That do sounds you, amazing. We'll do the total Brew, rank. Do you, Brew, do you agree with me that it's not a, a hard line or anything like, but there is some spot along the path between player rank number one and player rank number 200 where the pendulum swings more towards the per game side. Like I think I would, for me, I think I would rather have uh, a guy who's a little bit more injury prone. Who's like the number 65 ranked player versus a very durable guy putting up a hundred range type of production on a game to game basis. But as you look more towards the front end of a draft for me, like the guy who's the number four per game guy versus the guy who's like the number 12 per game guy. If your number 12 dude is playing 10, 11, whatever extra games at the end of the year, that guy ends up being more valuable. So then totals become the more relevant ranking. Do you have any idea of where that, that pendulum yeah. swing is? I think for me, it's somewhere like between 60 and a hundred. Yeah, this is also formats. Leaks. Like, yeah, uh, leaks. I know you play a lot of games cap leagues. Game, like, so games cap versus just straight up, you know, letter rip. You, you're going to have a higher uh, requirement of value for a guy to be effective in your league. So you're looking at, hey, 100's not working for me. 75 is my cut line. And so when you talk, I think I've been trying to spearhead that movement for years is tell me what you're talking about when we're talking about ads and drops, 
you know, there's a, there's a lot of different formats and a lot of different um, you know, specifics that matter there. I think the cut line on this discussion is basically kind of backs into that. It's what's going on with the waiver wire. You know, if I can replace you with five other guys, fantasy basketball industry discussion here. If I can replace you with a bazillion players, then yeah, give me the guy who's got like no knees, but if he plays for 15 games, you know, they're, they're going to be spectacular. What if he happens to play 60 or 70, you know, give me that guy. And um, generally in drafts, that's kind of happening after a hundred, you know, depending on the size. So yeah, that makes sense. Hunting upside. And it's always, it's a question of the, the, probably the last piece of this is what does it do to your roster decisions to have risky or injury prone or longer developing players on your bench? Yeah. Is it that's impacting you? Questions, in, by the in, way. You're, you're, yeah, you're taking the like, next segment and rolling it right in. Go for it. Have at it. Sweet. It's, it's, it's what is it doing to your, your decision making to have to, you know, maybe you got a guy that you're playing for three games a week and you don't want that, you know, because you have player X on a bench who's, who's got to wait and get better or whatever the situation may be. And you might find that not this year, but like Amani Morris of, of yesteryear, you know, who's just hanging around 120, 150, but he's, he's reliable and he's just going to be there and you know what he's going to give you. That might actually play better, you know, than the, than the, the snazzy young player that's just not there yet. So you got to think about what all about, that stuff. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to jump in on you there. I thought, uh, I oh, thought okay. I, I thought I caught the end of the sentence, but I think we might have about a one second lag on this one. Um, what about this year specific to the board? I don't want to get into individual players necessarily, but just the way the board is constructed in, for instance, the, um, the industry mock, the fantasy NBA today, industry mock, the um i think five uh one two three four five i think there were seven centers that came off the board in the first four rounds combined which by the way that's quite low for a year where everybody's talking about how many centers there are but then to no one's surprise i think there was something like 12 that came off in the next three rounds so things like that brew now that you've done 30 drafts what sort of draft arc do you think makes sense this year? Should folks be trying to target guard stats early with the exception of a few, you know, unicorn-esque centers, Jokic, Embiid, guys like that, that are obviously going to go at the top of drafts. Is there a right or wrong strategy? Like if you get your bigs early, now you don't have to be a part of that run in the middle rounds. I know there's so many ways to skin a cap, but what feels like this sort of path of least resistance is the way I'll frame it for this season in terms of how to collect your stats. So I think with like one center versus two center leagues, I almost find the question somewhat irrelevant in the sense that you still need to win those big man stat categories, whether or not you're using them out of a utility slot, or maybe they also qualify at power forward. So how it's, it's basic roster construction. You know, I've played in a couple of leagues that have zero position requirements and they're just like, how about it? You know, build your team so the way you starters. want. 10 yep, utility 10 starters. And you, yeah. Wow. Exactly. And, and that's one way to skin a cat, but it's like, I, I like position eligibility because I think that it weeds out people, you know, you can, and take advantage of it and you know sort of, sort of the who, who works the hardest will win blah 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 yeah if you don't have um, position eligibility to, uh doesn't that really uh lend itself to hard punting because someone will just take like 14 point guards if it works yeah yeah maybe. if it works i mean that's the key question is is what can you actually pull off you know with that strategy um but yeah, no, I, I think with the center question, it's a it's a fun one because you kind of have to ask that question at every stage minus like first, second, third round. I think you're at that stage, you're taking the player you like. Kind of maybe that's a question that's a tiebreaker tie breaker kind of question. Say you got four guys that are available that would be on your short list of players. You view them all equally. 
one of them has center eligibility, like that's the guy because I want to get the center thing out of the way. Another thing, there are a lot of guards out there, just flat out. There's just a ton of guard stats. I don't want to say that it's like you can just sit there and wait on it. I don't think you can do that. Um, I wouldn't say that the problem is that pronounced, but there are a lot of guard stats out there. And then necessarily, I think the forwards market is kind of annually a little bit dry. And it, it, it's the same situation with forwards and centers. It's like, okay, do I want to get really crushed in either of these areas? And if not, okay, I got to take somebody who's lower valued than I would have wanted to take. You know, I'm not winning by three rounds on this guy. But it gets me out of a problem of having to pick from the bottom of the bucket later on with these guys. And how much do I like the back end players in those buckets? So you, you're coming across a player that might alleviate the pressure in those areas. Maybe got to take them early. Maybe I've got, you know, like Drew Holiday, you know, staring me in the face, you know, at some very advantageous place to selection, you know, selective. I got another guard just sitting there waiting. And it's like, nah, I don't know if I want to do that because I a, don't want to wait on the players that I consider in the, the bottom, you know, the back end of, of a bucket. And, and you just kind of constantly cross-reference that. Is this player who could solve this need, are they reliable? You know, if I'm going to take a haircut on this, are they reliable? Are they going to have an upward trajectory or is this like very risky? You know, and if it was very risky and I didn't like the player, no, let's take another, you know, give me another guard or forward, you know, or whatever the case may be. That's why this sport is great. I mean, out of 30 drafts, every single one of them has been different. And Do you while feel, certain oh, things remain sorry, the same, yeah, no, while certain things remain the same, every draft has been different. Do you, and, and this is going to be a, a hard one, and I, I'm trying not to, I'm trying my best to ask this question without um, putting anything out into the universe. First of all, people, you guys need to go get the B-150 if that wasn't immediately evident. It is the list that has dominated the industry for, what are we at now, like 15 years? When did you start the B-150 at uh, NBC slash Roto World? It was just Roto World back then. I think it was uh eight. 2009 no. I think it was 2009 so we're, so we're approaching 15 2009, years 2010? there are a lot of other top 150 lists floating around out there if anybody wants to know where that started actually was it evan on the football side <laughs> no yeah it was evan evan was yeah. the, the inspiration for it and uh yeah. thank you evan evan's one of the greatest he's uh love those guys over dtr they, they do he great work um yeah. i just you know what i love about that crew over there they're all the old roto world crew and, and even the ones that moved on in the tv and all that everybody just worked their butts off and they just weren't like in it for the whatever you know three seconds of youtube fame or you know whatever it is hey we're on youtube right now <laughs> oh this is youtube i thought we were just talking to each other no um that is how these no i love go. those guys and uh yeah one, one 150 was an evan thing and then i was like no i should do one for basketball the first one yeah. I looked at it the other day, it was so, it was like just the smallest amount of not work, but like, you know, it's just like this rickety thing. I just you laughed. looked at your first and one? It, yeah. From way back in the day. It was like a oh list of God. players. Yeah, Can it was a list of players. It? And then like, uh, I wouldn't. I, I Do you it. have it? Oh, my God. This would be the most amazing Easter egg ever. The first V150. I, I, I please dig it up and I will put it. it at like the very end of a future YouTube video and it'll just be this special prize for anybody who makes it all the way to the end of me yelling into the void for 45 minutes because that's my existence for the most part. Okay, so wait, the question I was, you don't need to find it right now. The question I was going to ask. I know, you, you sent me on a journey, man. I know, but I like this, that I really want to see the first B-150. I think that'd be absolutely freaking amazing. Um. So the reason I prefaced it with all of this was I don't want to try to get you to say like who the targets are that you're doing at the end. Folks need to go get the B-150 if they want those. But do you find that there's a particular category or a few that is easier to get 
in the very late rounds is steals. I think you said was one of them. Are there others that you feel like you can make up easier at the end of a draft, meaning things that you'd need to be more concerned with earlier and middle? Because personally, I don't think I'll you can make up. up. Yeah. Yeah. Go. Yeah. Let's hear yours. I was, I was just going to say, personally, I found that after you pass, there are a couple of interesting centers at like between 100 and 110 on ADP boards. Once you get past those, you get into some real boring plotter types, which I mean, sometimes I can handle it, but like you don't want to find yourself in a situation where you need to draft Steven Adams in a non punt free throw team. So I found centers to be a really weird position this year. Cause there are a ton between like 40 and 105. And there's just a few at the beginning and like none at the very, very, very end. What's that sort of, How's that? How does that? I want to say arc again, but I already used that expression earlier on. What is it? Do you find that's kind of hard to to squeeze out at the very end? Giggity. I think percentages are. are it's so funny because so many people just fade percentages in every respect. They're like, don't care. It's not a thing. Don't need them. Whatever. You know, I'm punting this or, or a player that's you know, good in percentages, but kind of bad everywhere else. They're like, nah, that player's not worth anything. Percentages, though, um, as you get to the bo the bottom of your draft and the back ends of your rosters, like players just simply aren't going to play enough to impact your percentages. So at the end, if you're chasing there, you're chasing. You know, you're, 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 you're kind of screwed there. Um, but I think the traditional ones are... I mean, I think steals are available, and that's that's just a that's more of a take on the market itself. But you know, a lot of years threes are, are available late. I've been noticing that they haven't been as available late this year compared to previous years. So I would, I, I would, I'm more interested in looking at that deeper. But but it's usually it's the points, it's the assists. And, the, and, and typically the blocks. So those three things. Um, and, you know, it's been interesting. Conversely, this year I've been able to find those late, more so than previous years. They're not there. You know, it's not just like sitting there waiting to be had. I mean, some years it feels like after like round nine or ten, you can't get a point and you can't get an assist. Just fly. Yeah. There's a couple you of them this year. Yeah, yeah, and I don't know. Gotta, I mean, you got to be comfortable going to old skirt with a few of those things, but nobody, nobody wants to walk down that path with me. There, you know what, man? There are a lot of values late. I, I'm drafting in into the two twenties right now, two thirties, two forties, with guys that are hitting like a 130, 140, 150 rank. So I think what's I mean, coming up, everybody. That you gave me a perfect segue. 30 deep is coming up, brew. 30 deep's coming yes. up. Yes. I, I know. Hitters, I'm man. excited. Can we? Well, you uh, know what I'm not excited about is freaking Mike Pandador. Oh, my God. He says that tongue in cheek, though. Panda is our, has long been oh, our we love Panda. at Sports Ethos. Two time winner in what, five years? He's destroying that damn league. And he beat me well, in the final. He, does, he does the best player previews in the industry. And it's so not even close. Yeah, like it's not any close. player preview written anywhere else is never going to be as good as what Panda does. So he's just 500 players deep. He's not going to miss anything. And that's why he wins 30 deep because the rest of us are dicking around at pick 340. Whoa. He's like, this is my guy. This is my guy. This and, is my guy. And he and I share intel. So it's like there's no secrets between the two of us. And and it's, so it's like it's really fresh. I'm sure he has the same thoughts. It's like. I just know when Panda's got two picks between me and whoever I go, there's two that are off the board. Yeah, you're not, yeah, you're not just guaranteed. That. No, and, and we're talking in the, the context of 30. Did you know there are like 30 picks or 50 picks even, you know, that are going to happen between the time you go and you get your next pick. And so, I mean, you know that going into it. I'm like thinking if not for Panda, I'm going to get this player and 
every single year he just snakes me. It's terrible. Yeah. And, and then he wins. Won again. And like, then he wins. Oh. Yeah. I really thought yeah, I had maybe, last year. Maybe, I don't need to go too far down that rabbit hole. It makes me feel sad again that I got to the finals and <laughs> lost to Panda. <sighs> Panda. Uh, that's coming up. That's going to be fun. You've got your... I know you don't want to talk about it too much, but you've got your big leagues coming up this weekend, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. High stakes leagues. And again, literally the draft tracker has opened it up for me to be able to be in more drafts than I've ever been in. So it's exciting. I love it. I feel like I've, you know, you, you, you prepare for a test and you know, you're ready and you're not even worried about it. You just go in, you're going to take the test, you know, walk out. You just know you did a good job. So that's a feel right now. Um, Andre Limos, amazing, you know, just asset for this team in general, but working with him on this stuff, um, as discussed in, in previous shows, being able to rely on him for the data entry, but also the basketball analysis, he and I have been able to bounce all sorts of ideas that we would have just never gotten to um, if I was doing it on my own. And uh, yeah, no, I feel like every stone's been turned. It's good, we're ready. I love it. Uh, any other thoughts on helping a novice navigate a draft before we uh, put a little bow on this bad boy? You got to have a draft tracker. I mean, that's just outside of that. Um, Oops. I would say if you've got a good list, see if you can invest in some non guards early. Because you're going to get good guards no matter what. So if you've got a tiebreaker, go with non-guards. Yeah, I'm actually inclined to agree because that does sort of fall into what I was saying after pick whatever. What did I say? 110, 115. The number of centers is a little tougher at that point. But there are, I've found, guards and almost, almost all of my uh, late grabs. Even ones that people hate. Old guys, young guys, the whole thing. They all end up being guards and wings at the end. Um, so yeah, I think I'm, I think I'm very much on board with that as well. Uh, friends, he is the wonderful, the magnificent, the svelte skinny as all damn hell. Aaron Bruski on the other end of this thing. Do you even recognize yourself when you look at the YouTube videos after we've recorded them? Nope. Nope. I get, I get, I get a lot of concerned people, you know, that they think I've lost too much weight. What was yeah, this? Uh, yeah, one grandmother need, I was talking with earlier me, today. <laughs> Do you need me she to be your Jewish really, grandmother? She, she, yeah, Maybe. I didn't know she was Jewish Maybe. until you just mentioned it. Broski, I probably could have. I, I probably. It's getting involved. Oh on. wait, I, I hear her again. There she is. Where yeah, is she? she's back. It's fine. She usually ends most of her sentences with "Do it for Mama." Whenever people are going to get that reference, not as many as I wished. Oh well, you look good, big guy. You look, you look clean. You look I ready to you. rumble. Yeah. He is the svelte Aaron Bruski at Aaron Bruski, B R U S K I. I know people butcher that plenty. I am at Dan Vespers. This is Fantasy NBA Today and the Sports Ethos YouTube page. Please take a moment to like, rate, subscribe. You guys know the drill at this point. Uh, Brew, you and I doing this one more time before the season starts, or are we hopping on after we see the first crazy, you know what, action? We, we got to get that figured out, and we got to get the um, the secret show. Sealed in. Rich. Oh, this yeah. is real. He's not Here's joking about that. We do need to that. I can't wait for this. This is this is why you had the fantasy pass. The same fantasy pass, secret show, email list, secret show. I have a great Wednesday? Question mark. I'm Ron Burgundy. It's Wednesday. I got it. It's all figured out. Basketball in six days. Later, everybody. <laughs>